This is episode number 82 featuring artist Dave Santianis. This is the Plan Air Podcast with Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plan Air Magazine. In the Plan Air Podcast, we cover the world of outdoor painting. Called Plan Air, the French coined the term, which means open air or outdoors. The French pronounce it Plan Air. Others say Plain Air. No matter how you say it, there is a huge movement of artists around the world who are going outdoors to paint. And this show is about that movement. Now, here's your host, author, publisher, and painter, Eric Rhodes. Thank you, Jim Kipping. Welcome to the Plein Air Podcast. I'm Eric. The Easel Brush Clip is the sponsor today. Cool tool that you can put on your easel to hold your brushes. Very cool tool, by the way. That can be used to stabilize your umbrella, too. But it's great because I no longer drop my brushes, and they're right there in view And what I do in the studio is I use it, I I put the brushes that I most use, that I most want to use right there in front of my face so I can easily grab them. Anyway, check it out, easelbrushclip.com. The interview is underwritten by the second annual Figurative Art Convention and Expo, one of the great ways for any artist to perfect their skills at figurative or portrait painting. Uh, Instructors include David John Casson, Michelle Dunaway, Casey Baugh, Sadie Valeri, Bert Silverman, Uh, You can learn more about this event in Miami in November at figurativeartconvention.com. Well, let's get right to our interview with Dave Santianis. I'm honored today to have Dave Santianis on the uh, Plein Air podcast. Dave, welcome. Thank you. It's great to be here. Well, it's been fun watching your career. You and I met a long, long time ago, and uh, your career is just on fire. It seems like you're winning tons of awards and... um, getting asked to some of the major events and uh, it's really fun to watch. How's that feel? Oh, it, it's, it's been amazing. And, and part of it is, you know, you keep doing the same thing you've been doing for years and then suddenly something happens and people take notice and it feels like it's happened organically by just doing what I love to do. So that in itself feels great to me. Well, that's called momentum. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, some... and, and sometimes it just snowballs. I mean, it it feels like I haven't changed a thing in the last twenty years, except you know, continuing to paint. And I think that's that in itself has paid off. But yeah, momentum is is a funny thing. You never know when it's going to happen, but um, you know, if you're doing what you love, it doesn't matter. Well, we talk a lot about that in in, uh, our marketing sessions and so on and and how one can create momentum, but sometimes the momentum creates itself. And and in your particular case, there probably are a couple of moments where something occurred that you may not have even thought were important, but may have uh, brought you to to light and got you more noticed. Anything come to mind? Uh, Honestly, I... For me, it's probably been plein air events um, brought that. You know, I I, uh, I think I got into my first plein air event in the, oh, maybe 2006, 2007. And, and I think just painting in that um, environment, not only did it make me a better painter, but people took notice, galleries took notice. I, I don't think... I had one gallery initially that had ever seen my work until a plein air event. So it was a way to forward market and at the same time become a better painter outdoors. That's a tremendous Um, amount of work, though. Um, So you've been doing it for 11 years, been on the circuit. How many plein air shows do you do a year? Um, What's the most you've ever done in a year? I I think the most I've ever done in a year... is probably eight or nine and it is a grind i i ended up so in the last three years i haven't done any i I kind of stopped doing plein air events um and and part of it was because it it is a grind but some of it was philosophical i i really um didn't look 
at painting outdoors as the end all be all for a painting. I, for me, it was a springboard to a studio piece. And, and I always had that approach. Even when I first started painting outdoors, oh, it was probably back in 2000. Um, I didn't care if I got a good painting or not. I was just out there, A, enjoying being outside, and B, just trying to take notes and and get better at painting. But for me, it was just to do a bigger studio piece. And I think um, that was one of the reasons why I kind of got off the circuit, so to speak, was I wanted to focus more on studio pieces and go back to painting outdoors just for the pure joy of being outdoors and painting and not thinking, oh, man, i got to stick this in a frame when I'm done. Um, so for me, that that was kind of a... But that being said, having that pressure also made me a better painter. So I would never change a thing. I, I think doing nine events was grueling, but in the end, you're you're in this environment with your, your buddies and, you know, you, you're all under a little bit of pressure and that's when you really bond with, I think with, with other people when you're in a pressure environment and you're all doing the same thing. It, it's just, I'll, I'll never regret doing that for that well, reason. It wasn't nine events. It was uh, 90 events or a hundred and, nine yeah. events or something like that. So, you know, some of them repeated, yeah. but uh, that's a tremendous amount of work. So for yeah. the person out there who is kind of considering this idea of getting out on the circuit, uh, what advice would you have for them? What are the pros and cons? Um, and, and how would you go about it knowing what you know now? Well, I would say keep your philosophy going into the event. Your So some artists paint outdoors, to get a finished painting and I admire that and I think that's beautiful but if that's not your philosophy don't go to an event and change your philosophy um, I did that on in some events and, and I made worse paintings <laughs> because of it I I think there's a there's an in, instinct to say okay this is going in a frame I have to make it sellable and finished and refined and if that's not the way you paint outdoors, don't don't make it your way of painting outdoors just for a, an event. Um, I, I think from a purely philosophical standpoint, I was always drawn to those gem paintings that weren't finished, but you could see the artistry and the brevity of the painting versus those really refined um paintings that you know maybe would be more what you would do in a studio I was always drawn to the those really brief statements that captured everything and I I think that sometimes you'd get into plein air events where the collector they seemed more geared towards refined work and then you get into the the idea that well I, I've got to really play to the collector and you change who you are so my advice would be, don't do that. <laughs> Just so it's, it's more, keep it's your a, philosophy, your philosophy. It's more of a product mentality. But but don't you think, um, even when you're in the studio, isn't it crossing your mind that I've got to paint something that's going to sell? Well, I yes and no. I mean, this is how you I make think, your living. Yeah, it, it is. And, but I've also gotten into this... Um, and that that is you can't divorce yourself from that entirely um but at the same time i think if you compromise too much there's that that fine line where if you compromise too much you're a graphic artist and not a fine artist i think there's a, a degree of fine artistry that is you that's who you are um and i and i came from a graphic design um background so I know what painting to a a client is all about, and it's um, it's very much different than painting for yourself and having someone love it as much as you do. I think that there is a fine line there where sometimes I felt like I was crossing that at plain air events. So back to advice, but then, you know, you, yeah, and and I think you get a 
you know when you have. Um, it's it's a pretty obvious moment, and then you go back the other way, and, and you get that chip on your shoulder, and you say, okay, I'm not doing that. <laughs> I'm not doing that again. So back to advice for somebody who's considering it. Um, what what would you do differently if you had to do it other than okay, paint paint for yourself? But you know, you, you're going out, you're going on the road nine times a year. You're you have um, time, gas, hotel rooms. Uh, you've got to yeah. produce paintings that are going to sell. Otherwise, you're yeah. going to be not eating and you're going to be embarrassed. Um, so yeah. what would you do differently knowing what you know now? Um, I, Gosh, I, I don't know that I would change much. I, I think I would um, – I, I don't think I would do nine a year. I think what, what I found even after – that was if I if I did three or four plein air vents and then spent the rest of the time in the studio making bigger larger paintings um, that that was a good you know if it was 50 50 that felt like a good breakdown to me because when I get in the studio I can't wait to get outdoors and when I'm outdoors I'm thinking I can't wait to get this information back in the studio (laughs) and so I think one feeds the other and you know, if right now it's not 50, 50. So I want to go back to, you know, maybe getting in one or or two plain air vents or just getting outdoors more. Um, so I think balance is important. If I was to do it again, I would definitely try and maintain a balance between studio and outdoor work. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I feel, feel like in, you know, just to make, the point more clear because you're absolutely right you're thinking about sales but if that's the only drive in what you paint uh, you're not going to be happy with your work and and that was the fine line that we walked in plain air events so and, and I felt really happy with the work that I ended up producing because of that well, there's, there's, you know, there's this discipline thing. I, I uh, do these events every year in the Adirondacks and Fall Color Week and so on. And what I find is that um, after I paint two paintings a day every day for a week, I am so tuned up and so much better by the end of that week. And yeah. sometimes that lasts oh, yeah. me all summer uh, or longer. And I just I see tremendous amounts of growth by having that discipline of getting out. And yet, um, some of us just aren't going to get out there as much. Yet, these shows kind of drive yeah. you out there. You, you know, you're out there, you're trying to crank out a couple a day. Um, you want to make sure you've got good things for the show. And you do have to kind of, yes. you, you are competing, so you're trying to do your best, which has kind of flicks a switch in your head uh, that, you know, yeah. I really got to, I got to nail it. I got to get it right. So you don't give yourself as much of an excuse for failure. So there is some benefit to it for sure. Oh, definitely, and and that's the beautiful thing about them, and it's a beautiful thing. We did a another took just uh, some buddies of mine, and there's about a group of sixteen of us did a raft trip down the Grand Canyon, and that was equally it. It wasn't. Um, I mean, it wasn't a plain air event, so we didn't have frames, or we we didn't have that type of pressure. But the pressure when you're painting with your buddies, it's a fun pressure because you don't, you know, you're painting with friends and colleagues. You, you want to paint well. Yeah. And I think that type of a trip, you know, sounds very similar to that around that trip where you're with colleagues and you want to paint well. And so you're and, mm-hmm. and that along with the fact that you're painting, you know, three or four paintings a day, you can't help but become more confident as a painter doing that. Absolutely. So that, well, yeah, yeah. And there's that, so many good things over the years that I got out of plain air events that, um, you know, I, I think I owe a lot of that momentum we talked about to them. Yeah. Well, there's a season for everything and, and you, you know, you did that. You, you since have had a family. Um, you've got a little girl yes. now, right? It's a little girl. Yep. T- yep. Two, two years old. She keeps me on my toes. And, and, and that's, you know, that is the number one reason pro- why I 
I'm not doing plein air events now. Now you um, met your wife. But she comes out painting with us. Does she? You met your wife at a plein yeah, air she, event, is that right? Yeah, yeah. So talk about benefits of plein air events. That's <laughs> a pretty major one. Yeah, that's. But yeah, so. I met her in in Hawaii, and and it was a a thing. It happened. You know, it was very. Um, uh, it, well, what what happened was a Facebook friend um, who I hadn't met. She she found out I was coming out to Maui, and she wanted to know if I wanted to paint after the event. And by the way, I could stay at her her. Uh, she had a guest house in Maui, and you know who would turn down staying <laughs> extra week in Maui to paint. So so I said yeah. Um, and it turned out that, you know, my wife, who at the time I didn't know at all, she showed at the gallery that hosted the event. And then so I met, chatted with her that night and then found out that the Facebook friend who I was staying with after uh, lived two minutes from from Heather. So we ended up painting together for that week and then uh, you know that was the the start of it and then when I came back home um, we kept in touch obviously and and we started FaceTiming from our studios so we were basically sharing a studio um, from Maui to Colorado so so we would FaceTime for four hours at a time while we painted in our own studio so Love, now, love at now, first uh, paint. We, yeah, <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. So, but yeah, paintings had some some really great connections like that for me. And again, I think it's just it, it seems like things fall into place when when you're doing what you should be doing. But we we had a um, after we um, when Heather moved out here. Uh, to Colorado. So somehow I convinced her that Colorado was, was better than Maui and she bought it and she uh, moved out here and she, she now agrees. She let she likes it um, better than Maui. But um, when Callie was about to be born, we decided we needed to find a bigger, a bigger place. So we were looking in Fort Collins and, and couldn't find anything, so then we we uh, decided to go with a new build in a town outside Fort Collins. And during this time, I was uh, emailing back and forth with uh, a uh, a guy who wanted to take a workshop. He said he was semi-retired and had always loved painting, and is just finally now getting a chance to. And he had seen my work in Steamboat, and so. Um, you know, we were emailing back and forth and he said, by the way, I live in Fort Collins. Do you ever plan on teaching there? Um, and I said, no, but we're building a home in, in uh, Wellington, just north of Fort Collins. And he said, oh, that's funny. I, I own a subdivision out there. And so it turns out he was building our house. Oh, wow. What a um, small world. So it was <laughs> small, small world. And so we've become good friends since then. And, and, you know, we did some, um, ended up doing a commission for him, but, um, but just, you know, art is kind of a connector in many ways. And that is just a, one of those many ways that it's, it's transformed my life. But. So, uh, you wrote something, um, recently in the oil painters of America blog, you wrote a piece called The Worst Painting Ever. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it was funny. It, it all started in, um, you know, when you're out painting at these events, um, especially if you're near a roadside, people are going to yell stuff out at you. And it, it's it's pretty funny. I mean, when you think about it, who drives around just yelling at random things <laughs> at people on the side of the street? But for some reason, when you're painting, it, it um, encourages that <laughs> it, and it's always funny you never pay any attention to it but I 
I had just been thinking about these things when this guy drives by and yells out, worst painting ever. <laughs> and I, I thought, you know, it might be, but it's a, it's a good study. <laughs> and, and I thought that would have been funny to yell back. He wouldn't have known what the heck I was talking about, but, but it kind of spurred the, the blog about, you know, if your approach is just to study, you might paint the worst painting ever, and it might be the best study that you could have done. So what works as a finished painting, there's, there's different criteria than what works for just studying, just studying light. Um, you know, just studying light may not resolve itself as a painting at all but there'll be some really good stuff in there. I was uh, and, visited with Albert Handel after the plein air convention. I went over to his studio and we were talking about this very subject. And he said, you know, when I go out plein air painting, he said, I go out with a very specific mission in mind. He said, I have something I want to learn. He said, it might be yeah. focusing on branches and, and I just want to focus on doing really great branches or learning branches or following, you know, how the light falls on branches so I'll I'll set a goal for myself to just think about branches and and then you know I might the next 10 times I go out I might be just focusing on branches and the next time I might be focusing on rocks or dirt or something else. So yeah, he said the, that's the awesome. he said um he said there are painters who are plein air painters and there are people who claim to be plein air painters who who just do studio paintings outdoors. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, that's uh, that's it sounds like we are um, we're on the same page for sure with that um, because I, you know, there are some times when just for the pure challenge I'll do that, but generally it doesn't work because I'm just trying to um, capture something as a photo might capture it, but when I'm really just studying. I, that's when I feel like I'm really painting. And I, it sounds like Albert is the same way that, you know, you can get more when you tackle less and are focused at what you're trying to achieve. So, well, there's something so that, to, that's great to hear. Something to be said about instincts as well. Um, I've had this discussion with many painters who have told me that some of the best works they've ever done were the works where they had to rush through it. They had very little time. The, you know, the sun was setting. They had, you know, they just had to kind of lay it in fast and they got some of the most exciting and responsive works that they've ever created because they weren't overthinking everything. Yeah. Oh, that, that's huge. And and I, I've, uh, I even mentioned it in this um, blog that, you know, when you're working fast and you're you're automatically eliminating the things you don't want to paint or, you know, aren't interested in, and it makes a better painting because you're, elim- you're not painting that stuff. And if you had, you know, six, seven hours, you may, you may start, you know, nitpicking little things that um, you're not interested in just to have them in there because they're there. Pa- painting things just because they're there is a, is a bad formula for a painting. And so learning what, what really inspires you is something that happens outdoors because you're not going to paint the stuff that doesn't inspire you. Now, when you, and, and in, yeah, I'm sorry. Well, when you, when you go outdoors and you see something that really speaks to you, um, let's say it's a, you know, a tree, do you paint the mm-hmm. thing that interests you first and then complete the rest of the painting after that? Or do you kind of build the framework first? What, because there's a lot of different philosophies on how to do that. I, I would, and I would say I do both. Um, th- th- there are times and I'm working on a waterfall scene now, but I wanted to lay in the atmosphere first because that's part of the story of this waterfall is the setting that it's in. So I wanted to lay in those layers of atmosphere so I'm almost building around the main subject first, but there are there are times when if if it's a more uh, narrow vision, I'll paint the thing that I'm most interested in first, 
And then it kind of gives you an idea of what you need around it to support it. So two different two different ways, but I think in general at the end you're answering the same question. Did I put too much to take away from what I really wanted to paint? Or do I not have enough to create the scene around the subject that I want? Do you, Ultimately, no matter which approach, you, you end up answering the same question. Do you tend to push atmosphere? I, I do, but not. I wouldn't say I do it on purpose. I think when I'm laying things in initially, it seems right. And then by the time I get to the end, it, it feels like maybe I pushed a little bit. And ultimately, I feel like that's okay. Um, it, one of the things when I was uh, demoing at the plain air convention that I mentioned is, is once you kind of learn uh, what is happening with atmosphere, then you're free to push it if you want. At least you're doing it on purpose at that point. Um, it, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things, being able to control where you want things to sit in a landscape in, a, in an atmospheric sense, I think is equally important to where you position them, you know, in that little square surface. So, um, so yeah, I, I think I just to answer your question. Yeah, I, I do tend to push it and, you you know, uh, I I don't mind that. I guess you, you were one time telling me about how the English language kind of tends to um, inhibit our ability to paint atmosphere. Yeah. Do you want to tell everybody about that? Yeah, it you know the, this um, really kind of showed itself right before the convention I taught in Sedona, and that's as they promote it, red rock country. Well, the word red kept coming up as a, uh, a bad word in the workshop because on an atmospheric level, red for that red rock was only pertinent in the foreground. By the time you got to the middle ground, we had to come up with different colors to describe the color of that rock. Um, so I was kind of moving them down from red of the rock that you're holding to maybe it's a purplish reddish grayish rock, <laughs> you know, in the mid ground. And, and then I thought the word red, because, you know, I'll always try to get my students to describe the paint color they're going to use first. And when you're looking at a mount, a red mountain, see there, I, I just use the word red, a red mountain a mile away, it's not red anymore. Why There's you, a different color. Why do you want them to describe it? Just so that they get a plan, get a game plan for mixing paint. I think if they can talk me through what they're seeing first, because really with atmosphere, a lot of times we are, we're somewhat tricked by the language. So um, when we're looking at a mile of atmosphere, and let's say it's not red, let's say it's it's uh, yellow. We see yellow, a yellow light on a distant mountain, and we reach for cad yellow, we just crushed atmosphere. So when we see yellow on a on a mountain that's two miles away, what other color can we use besides yellow to describe that color? And a lot of times it's just a light gray or maybe a touch of something like transparent red oxide, which has nothing, you know, it's not yellow, but by the time we put it down, surrounded by all those cooler shadows, suddenly it feels just vibrant yellow. And I think, but, but if I'm looking at a mountain and I'm just a tourist or a passerby, I might say, wow, look at that yellow light on that mountain. That's incredible. And it infiltrates our thinking. We think, he just said it's a yellow light. I've got to use yellow to paint it. And I think that inhibits our ability to really paint atmosphere. Well, and it, so it, it was, inhibits other things as well, because we, you know, we have, when, when we're kids and we're coloring, you know, we make our trees look like lollipops and, yeah. and you yeah. know, you, you, you have to overcome that. And, and it's amazing to me. I was in the, yeah. I was in the studio last night and I was, I was putting a bunch of trees in, making them up in my head, and I, 
I step back to get a perspective and they all look like, you know, the same, same rounded lollipops. I'm still doing it 600 yeah. years later. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, it, it, it's funny. It, you know, a lot of it is training. I, I, um, I've since come up with in my workshops, at least I've said, trust, trust your eye in the foreground, paint what you see in the foreground, but in the background, revert to what you know, you know, you can't use yellow to describe that yellow light in the background. So what else can you use? And and that's kind of helpful, but teaching is funny because a lot of it is, is how can I, manipulate the language that I'm saying in the paint, how can we translate all of that? So it's, uh, it, it's interesting. You, I love teaching though. You have been to and attended lots of workshops, lots of events. How do you teach differently? How do you approach teaching differently? Well, I, uh, it's basically, well, first of all, I'm honest. I, I, uh, it's basically everything I've learned and struggled with or learned from struggling. And I think um, I'm honest when I don't know something. And I think that that's, um, and I'm not saying that, you know, artists that I've known and have been dishonest with me about anything, but I just think that there's an appreciation when you are honest that you're really trying to help them. You know, you're not trying to steer them right. Just, um, and you're not, you know, it's not about ego. It's about helping um, students learn. So I think just being honest and, and in part of that, all the mistakes that they're making, you know, I can honestly say I've made every single one of them and still make them today when I'm outdoors painting. It's not, it's not an easy thing. And, and you know, I, I think that that's, probably my number one philosophy going into teaching is that, you know, just being honest, as honest as, as I would want them to be. So, so you, um, you're currently in a, uh, a few galleries, I assume, how many galleries and what's that like for you now? You, especially now that you're not doing the plein air events. Um, what's life I, like as a gallery artist? It's been great. It, it's really been great. I, uh, I'm in seven, seven galleries right now, which is a lot. And I feel like I am, you know, probably at that threshold, you know, um, uh, where it, it might be too many at this point, but, um, but it's been great. Um, there's been, you know, it's, it's changed over the years when, since when I first got into galleries, Artists are doing a lot more marketing of themselves. And, you know, it's kind of changed the dynamic of gallery relationships with artists, I think. Um, I had a really frank discussion with a gallery owner about that. And he was um, not happy that artists felt like they needed to um, hand out personal business cards at his gallery functions. And for me, I, I was thinking that's what we've always done as artists. We've promoted ourselves and that's honestly how the gallery found Found us. Right. (laughs) Exactly. So it it seemed like a strange thing. And, And I get what he was trying to, prevent was artists going, you know, handing a business card to one of his clients and then they contact the artist directly. And I said, you know, this, that might happen. That absolutely might happen, but you can't control the things that you can't control. Let it happen and then cut the artist loose. Well, and and I think that's the point is that you have, uh, this this is something that it, it's pretty easy uh, to find any artist in the world. You, if you can't find a website, you're going to find them on LinkedIn or something. And and if somebody wants to exactly. contact you direct, they're going to contact you. But the minute you fall into that trap of playing that game of selling direct to a customer from the gallery, 
your your career yeah. is over. And at least exactly. I, I, th- I think it is. I mean, I, I watched, I was with a, um, a gallery owner in Santa Fe who um, pointed out a, um, an artist and he, he was removing this artist from his walls. And I said, uh, he's, I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm packing this artist up and sending him back. And I said, why? And he said, well, somebody went direct uh, they tried to negotiate with me. I wouldn't negotiate the price down any further. They went direct to the artist. The artist called, got the painting back, made up some lame lie. And and then the, yeah. the guy called me yeah. and said, na, 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 na. I bought it direct from the artist for half the price. So he fired the artist. Yeah. And, and of course, everybody yeah. knows everybody in this industry. So, yeah, you know, exactly. that, that's kind you of the end of, end of your career if you if you play that game. You know, my, yeah, my gallery, yeah. and, it's interesting, my it's gallery a... will give me the names of the people who bought my paintings and ask me to send them a nice card because they know that I'm not going to yeah. violate that, that relationship. Yeah, and, and I think that's ultimately what it's about is trust and integrity. And if there's not trust, then you need to fire the artist or or an artist, on the other hand, can fire the gallery owner because what, what I mentioned um, to him was, you know, there's also another aspect that I don't think any gallery owner considers, and that's what if a client comes in to a gallery and they walk in looking specifically for my work, and the gallery owner doesn't really need to ask why or have to ask why, but maybe this guy has seen my work on Facebook for 10 years and walk in, finds out I'm showing at this gallery and then decides, I, I've got to go in this gallery, and, and then ends up buying a painting because he's been Facebook friends for 10 years. Yeah. Now, that's not something a gallery owner could possibly... Uh, it, would, it would be um, prohibitive of them to always find out, well, how, how did you come across this artist? Well, and people aren't so, always honest, and they all, and, and, or they don't even know. You know. Sometimes you know something, and you don't know why. It just happens. Exactly. Yeah. So, and, and that's why my point was, you, you have to start with trust. And, and when that ends, then you go separate ways. But I, I would never expect a gallery to find out exactly how every client who bought every painting of mine came across my work because it would be to a level of ridiculousness that just wouldn't, wouldn't be worth the time and effort. So and how so do you manage... I imagine... I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, oh no, I, I was just going to say, I can imagine scenarios where someone comes and wants a commission, and even, you know, if you do your du- due diligence as an artist and try and figure out how they came across your work, you may never find out for sure. Yeah. They might not even know. So I think that falls in that gray area of, you know, let it go. If someone from my personal Facebook community goes into gallery and buys a painting, I'm not going to demand an extra uh, commission cut from that sale. It's just one of those gray areas that you just let go. Well, and some, you know, sometimes I was in a show and um, a a year after the show, uh, and it was not a gallery I was typically in, a year after the show, uh, somebody contacted me from from a post of something I had done on Instagram, and they said, I want to buy that painting. And so I sold him the painting, and then I sold him three others, and uh, I sent a check to the gallery, the commission, the full commission, because I felt like it was the right yeah. thing to do. And and yeah. the the gallery owner was like, "Well, this is totally unnecessary." I said, "Look, this lead came from you. This is this yeah. is what you get." And so and and but you know but, that gallery owner will never yeah. forget that, and that's the way that business exactly. should be done. So exactly, and I, I had a gallery owner who who paid me twice for the same painting and I sent the check back and and she swore that it was right and then she looked it up and said and I could hear in the background she goes um they think we paid him too much and then they looked it up and found out that they actually had and they never would have caught the mistake but it just feels better to have a relationship like that that's you know where there's honesty than, you know, the other end of that. Well, and it cuts both ways. You know, I was, an edge. Yeah, I was with an artist last night who was 
was telling me that he knew his gallery had sold. They told him they sold a painting two months ago. Uh, they were waiting for the house to be built, and they haven't shipped the painting yet. So he's like, well, why haven't you paid me? I, you know, you got your money. I haven't got mine. Well, we haven't shipped it yet. And they're, you know, and they're playing yeah. games with him. And so he's going to resign yeah. from the gallery because he knows yeah. that they're they're working off his money. They're probably, you know, doing that to all their artists. And and so you know, it works both ways. How do you deal with those situations exactly. when you find uh, find out galleries are playing those kind of games? I I think I've always just had the philosophy of vote with your feet. You know. <laughs> You, there's, there's probably things you could do legally, but I think just leaving those galleries and, like you said, I think our union as artists is a verbal one. We, we're not. There's no organized union, but people talk. If if there's a gallery that's mistreating artists, every artist is going to know about it. Yep, that's right. And and I think gallery owners are the same way. They they know the artists who are not on the up and up and who are just trying to get an advantage. So so I think it does go both ways, but that's always been the way I handle it is, you know, exactly what my advice was to this gallery owner was trust until you can't trust any trust, but verify, I guess is the, <laughs> that phrase trust. And, and, and when you can't trust anymore, just leave, separate. Yeah. We've, it's uh, not going to work. We've encountered some things lately where we'll learn about an artist who's in a plein air show who nobody ever sees around town, and then they come in with all these beautiful works, and they uh, they've yeah. gone to their hotel and done them on their monitor uh, in the studio. Yeah. That's one we learned about yeah. an artist who um, had gotten his canvases stamped or her canvases stamped. I'm not sure which, and then um, uh, glued paintings to that those canvases they probably had done in their room and got caught. Yeah. And so you know those those little things. Uh, or and and also yeah. copying of uh, other people's paintings from pictures online and then submitting them as original works. So. Oh yeah, see it. It does happen, and and there's just you know I don't know what pressure artists are putting on themselves to do that because I you know the very first plain air events I went to just as a uh, a uh, uh, stri I mean I wanted to be in these events, but before you're in the events, you go to the events and you, and you look at all the paintings and the, the gems of paintings, the ones that I, were truly plain air were the ones that always resonated with me. And I, from that point, I, that made me realize I had to paint outdoors and you have to do it um, to get better anyways. You, you could always start a painting outdoors, finish it in the studio from a photo and you're not getting the same um, return as if you go out there and struggle. So I would, that would be my other advice to, you know, uh, aspiring painters is go out and struggle and embrace that struggle because you're getting better. Whereas you could skip the struggle, go straight to painting from photos and your painting will never rise to the level that, that you want them to rise to. Yep. So embrace the struggle. Absolutely. I, I do it when I demo too. I, I'm like, yeah, this is, you know, even in workshops, I'll say, you know, this isn't working, but it might be because of this and, and talk your way through the struggle with, with the students has kind of been my approach. And that way they know it's a struggle for everyone, but right. it's about overcoming that struggle and how you overcome it and how you talk your way through these struggles. I think that's enormously yeah. important because, you know, we we get these ideas in our head that somebody who's an accomplished artist just does everything perfectly all the time. I remember the first time many, many years ago, probably 15 years ago, when I first interviewed Richard Schmid, uh, he was talking about all the dogs that, you know, the paintings he threw away that he that he never finished and, and the mistakes that he made. And I thought, that's so nice to hear that somebody yeah. at that yeah. level is still you know making mistakes fewer now i'm sure but you know i think everybody does it and i remember going to randy sexton's studio one time and flipping through he said don't look at those and i said why he says those are just paintings that i'm going to paint over those are 
you know, bad panels. And I, I my untrained yeah. eye, like these were great paintings, but he didn't want them out there in the market, which I thought was great. Yeah. That, see, and I think that, that, yeah, that's, that there's so much, um, to do in that because, um, he knows what he is looking to do with a painting and, and if they don't cut, I, I have some paintings that were once in frames that I've taken out and taken off the market because, you know, you grow as an artist and realize, I don't want that. I don't want that out there. Yeah, that's um, right. But it's funny, I, I'm looking at stacks of paintings in my studio that are, you know, from a purely, um, if you're judging it as a finished painting, these are all terrible paintings, but I can't let them go because there's so many good things in them that I like. And that's what was funny about someone yelling out worst painting ever is I've got a a lot of way worse paintings (laughs) in my studio (laughs) that had he seen those, you know, he he might've thought, well, maybe I misspoke. These are worse. (laughs) But I, I was know. I was standing I was standing in, in at outside of Notre Dame in Paris and I set up painted and there was a group of teenagers probably five or six of them sitting there smoking cigarettes and they watched me the full time and and this kid came up yeah. to me and he spoke English and he said you should give up painting <laughs> <laughs> See I don't know what it is you set up a painter anywhere and people are going to want to yell stuff say stuff <laughs> it, it's pretty funny well, Dave, this has been fun having you on the Plein Air Podcast. I, I really appreciate you taking the time today, and you're an inspiration to everyone out there. It was fun to watch you on stage. You had a massive crowd in the audience, probably eight or 900 people in there watching you, and it was kind of fun to see you on stage at, at the convention. So thank you for doing that, and thank you for doing the podcast. Well, thanks. That was a blast. Well, I really appreciate it. It's great, great chatting with you. Thank you again to Dave Santianis. Today's podcast was sponsored by the second annual Figurative Art Convention and Expo. You want to go to this to see everybody who's anybody in the audience, on the stage. It's like so cool and it's fun. It's not boring. It's not stuffy. It's held in Miami in November. You can learn more at the Figurative Art, uh, not the, at figurativeartconvention.com. And also sponsored by the Easel Brush Clip, the cool tool that you clip onto your easel to hold your brushes, keep them in sight, keep them from falling, and it's got a lot of other uses too. Uh, Anyway, check it out at easelbrushclip.com. And if you've not seen my blog called Sunday Coffee, you can check it out, coffeewitheric.com. That's where you find it. A lot of .coms in here. Well, I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plenary Magazine. This has been a lot of fun. Let's do it again sometime. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Goodbye. This has been the Plein Air Podcast with Plein Air Magazine's Eric Rhodes. You can help spread the word about Plein Air painting by sharing this podcast with your friends. And you can leave a review or subscribe on iTunes so it comes to you every week. And you can even reach Eric by email. Eric at pleinairmagazine.com. Be sure to pick up our free ebook. 240 plein air painting tips by some of America's top painters. It's free at plenairtips.com. Tune in next week for more great interviews. Thanks for listening.